it's as if the the crazy demand we saw the first uh, first quarter of this year has has really fallen off a cliff. Well, hello there, my friends. Chris Marcus here with you for Arcadia Economics. Once again, our weekly call with Andy Sheckman of Miles Franklin, where we'll get an update on anything that's changed in terms of premiums, availability, and anything else that is going on in the physical silver market. So, fortunately, today we are doing just audio as I am traveling, but fortunately, I was able to catch up with Andy. And Andy, thanks for making some time to check back in here today and. Before we get started, how is everything going with you? It's going good, buddy. Always good to hear your voice. I'm glad uh, glad you're doing well and, and that you were able to, to uh, connect with me even in transit as you are. So, yeah, happy to be here. Well, I appreciate that. And, again, uh, as we really check in with each week, just to give people an idea of, obviously, the summer is now underway. Things have been a little slower. We did have a... Uh, pretty big decline in the price last week a little bit higher to start this trading week but curious what the order flow has been like and any changes in premiums just so people can be aware of how things have progressed since that sell off last week yeah i mean it's look um it's really crazy to me it's as if um a lot of people have um just assumed that the problem with the the banks are behind us and uh that maybe the fed uh, will engineer some sort of a of a soft landing and all is okay on main street it's it's as if the the crazy demand we saw the first uh first quarter of this year has has really fallen off a cliff and as a result uh, premiums are the lowest i've seen them in over 3 years availability is across the board uh, as good as I've seen it in over three years. And, uh, yeah, you're right. The the spot price is, is hanging in, both gold and silver, certainly in a range that they did both get clobbered last week. Uh, you know, but when you see uh, you know, 26 million ounces dumped in 15 minutes, what's one to expect? You know, I, I think the price is hanging in there, and people who are looking to add to their portfolio – it hasn't been this opportune in terms of price, premium, availability, no delivery delay, really since 2020. So, Andy, based on what we've seen over the past couple of months, I'm curious, is, is this a lot different from years past, the way things have traded, and perhaps more importantly, is this what you would imagine we can expect going forward, that when there's some flare-up, we see the supply lines get tight and the premiums jack, and then as things calm down a bit, premiums come back in is this follow the traditional pattern and is this what you expect people should be prepared for going forward that's a great question actually chris it has followed a a similar pattern in the past although the the pattern itself is accelerating where we see these moments of chaos followed by moments of complacency they seem to be happening at a greater clip and a greater severity I think where where you'll see real change will be when this when the problems are ignited to the point where mainstream really can't help but notice the value found in in metals and in particular in silver and you you combine that with the exchanges being bled down to record low levels uh I think it's a recipe for you know for a massive increase in the price in particular of silver. Look, and I don't sell silver for people to buy to speculate on profit, but on every single metric, mind's eye goes to a place where due to in particular problems that we, I believe, will see growing problems with the banks, which I believe are nowhere near over, will certainly ignite a, a level of anxiety, maybe even compounded to what we saw with SVC uh, Bank and um, or, or SVB rather, and Silicon Valley and and Signature, where you know as a company we added close to 14,000 clients in 45 days, I had never seen anxiety and panic quite to that level, and yet that still I think really hasn't captured the mind's eye of the public yet, and I think you see uh, a situation where we see several banks go under, and this time. Uh, true to Janet Yellen's words, they're not bailed out, but rather bailed in, where we see 
people being viewed as unsecured general creditors rather than making being made whole, uh, you know, true to her word, unless, of course, those banks uh, uh, are agreed upon uh, uber-majority decision by the FOMC, the FDIC, Janet Yellen, and the president that they're too systemic to not be bailed out. If that happens, I think you'll see very quickly the public jump into this market. And one thing that I would caution people, and we've seen it already this year, that when it changes, it changes in the blink of an eye, where premiums will go up exponentially, availability decreases exponentially, delivery delays go up. It's a very fragile ecosystem that right now favors the consumer. But I think if people believe who are listening to this podcast that, you know, we're not out of the woods by any stretch of the imagination, it's when we get back into the woods, to what degree does that wake up the mainstream? And I'm betting that at some point, this goes to a place where the public can't help but notice there are very few places to go safely that, that check all of the boxes, not only for an amazing investment, but also to find some sort of refuge from the system that is collapsing outside the matrix. And I don't know, to me, there isn't a better place to be found than silver. And people listening to this already know this. It's their best friends and their neighbors and their family who have yet to get this. When they do, your question changes exponentially and goes from uh, goes from these cycles that we see to a cycle that doesn't come back because the public has so much firepower stocked up, so much money out there that it wouldn't take but a small increase uh, or a small interest from a large swath of the public to very quickly change the backdrop of this environment, of this market forever. All right. Well, that makes sense. And obviously, you can imagine people feeling that way after what we saw in the banking system earlier this year. Although I'm curious, with the people that you hear from, obviously, a lot of them are talking about money printing, banking stability. Do you hear from any people yet that are concerned about the supply and demand fundamentals? Do the customers, that they talk about the deficit that was reported by Silver Institute, some of the other issues where we see a lot of growing industrial use and, and the green use that, at least based on the numbers we have, suggests that things are not in the ideal situation for the silver supply going forward. Are many people talking about that yet who are actually purchasing silver, or is so far mainly just the economic and banking issues? No, an over-preponderance of them understand that. In fact, a lot of people will say, is there anything left? Will there be anything left? I get phone calls from people who are setting up IRAs and know that it's a you know a week to ten day process and say I geez I hope there is something left. It's there is a a, a keen awareness and here again this is of the chorus that we have been speaking to who understand and they're always going to be first to react. You know when the people who we do business with it's not like they give us all their money but when they see these events that happen they're quick to to reallocate or, you know, other funds into metals. And um, they're the ones who understand what's happening, and they're the ones who understand the supply-demand deficits and the fundamentals that speak to how, you know, just how frail this whole thing is. And it's when the public understands exactly what you're saying, that, you know, that, that there isn't enough supply out there to meet the the demand that is growing not only in its industrial and military applications, but in its monetary applications. And it's not just North America. These these problems we're seeing, you know, extend all throughout the rest of the world. And you know, Europe is in no better position, arguably, than the United States is. And so we're seeing demand in the U.K. and Australia. Well, you know, they're two, two of the six primary mints. So the rest of the world is, is, is has awoken, and I would argue that maybe more so to a large degree than the people in this country have. People around the globe understand what precious metals represent, and, you know, most of the globe is accumulating precious metals while people in the U.S. arguably have been asleep at the switch. So we are not only competing for uh, less metal because more people around the world are accumulating it during these times. But, you know, the, the reasons to, to speak of in terms of its geologic footprint as you speak to, uh, or its its 200-plus uh, million ounce shortfall as reported by the Silver Institute, 
last year, these are the kinds of things that the public, when they look to alternatives to traditional assets that arguably could really get hurt as things continue to play out with interest rates and markets and banks and all of the things that we talk about all the time, well, yeah, these are the realizations that will very quickly change the backdrop. This is That really is what I have been talking about all along when I ultimately say the market will be defined by a a gross inability to source product because there will come a time when the public wakes up. There's so much more money in traditional assets than there are in precious metals that, you know, I, like I said, I play golf with two guys that are on the Forbes top 50 list and both of them manage over $4 billion, you know, for Morgan Stanley. So there's so much money out there that has no allocation to metals whatsoever when these types of realities that the people we've been talking to and you've been educating for so long, when they finally understand this on a broad level, um, that'll be the catalyst to, you know, to really add fuel to to a, a fire where physical demand for product starts to really take hold as being a, a prime catalyst for not only the price of silver going higher, but the inability for companies like mine to keep it in stock. Yeah, I know what you're saying, and it will be interesting to see how things change as that develops more. And perhaps another part of the process that maybe we should talk about more, although Vince Lancey was mentioning it in his video that he had on Monday of this week, is the selling part where now obviously there's some people who buy silver, want to hang on to it, pass it on to their kids or grandkids, and certainly I can understand that. And some people who are really concerned about the currency and just want to have something that they're holding of value. But people who are investing and do at some point want to be able to cash that in or sell it. Obviously, the different products have different premiums. And Vince was just talking about that process of, being aware of the exit liquidity on some of the different silver products. And I was wondering if you could add anything there in terms of products that have better liquidity or anything in general in terms of what people want to be thinking about before they're purchasing particular products so they have an idea of what they can expect in terms of the selling back process. Yeah, I mean, I guess I would buy – that's another very good question, and and to me – You know, anything that's issued by the six primary mints of the world, that would be the United States, Canada, Austria, Australia, South Africa, and the United Kingdom, provide immediate liquidity, non-subjective liquidity. The difficulty lies in looking at the value proposition from the United States Mint. On one hand, the premiums have been so high on Silver Eagles that it becomes very hard to recommend buying them. On the other hand, you see states accepting silver coins issued by sovereign mints, not just the U.S., as legal tender, a few of them only use in the U.S., but you can understand the demand if this plays out, uh, if this continues to grow, this trend, where the U.S. coins really have fantastic demand uh, that are far greater than, uh, you know, the premium is far greater than than, uh, any of the other coins that we see out there. I guess the one thing that I would stay away from in that question, just about the only thing that I would stay away from would be certified MS69, MS70, first strike nonsense. I mean, those coins, the premiums are so high, you'll never get your money back out of them. If you buy them, look at them as a speculative cherry on top of your bullion Sunday. But, you know, just about anything issued in terms of bullion coins, the Maple Leaf, the Eagle, the Philharmonic, the Britannia, the Kangaroo, the Krugerrand, that's where there's great value. One ounce silver buffalo rounds, great value. And even some of the bars, five ounce, 10 ounce, kilo, 100 ounce, the one thing those bars don't offer is the um, use as as legal tender in these states that are actually accepting uh, any coins issued by a sovereign mint, past or present, not only for legal tender for things like paying your property tax, but any shop owner that wants to accept them. And the law, as to your point, does say 
the silver content plus any market premium. And so any of, any of the shopkeepers that would use these coins would have to be keenly aware of what that market premium is. And honestly, Chris, I mean, for most of my career, the market premium was pretty static. Um, but over the last three years, it's been anything but a tremendous variance no, you know, nowhere seen more so than in the price of the Silver Eagle. But yeah, I think if you want to remove that subjectivity, you stick with vanilla, and that would be any of the coins from the six major mints or one ounce silver rounds from respected refineries, which would be a distant second to me to any of the six major primary mint coins. All right. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and certainly the different types of products and the premiums can play a big difference. So. Uh, something if people have individual questions about, they can write into Arcadia at Miles Franklin, happy to get information to people that want to know uh, about any particular products and how that might affect things on the front end or the back end of the purchase. Just always something good to be aware of before you're investing in silver. And happy to get answers to any of those questions that people have. And Andy, I thank you once again for coming on here and giving some questions, answers to the questions that we have and that I get from the audience. And uh, anything else on your mind or the happening in the silver world that you feel people should be aware of before we wrap up for today? Uh, you don't know, no, really just that um, that I haven't seen a better time to, to add uh, any of the coins from the six mints I mentioned, including the U.S. mint, really since 2019. And so – you know, I, I, in my, in my gut, I am surprised that the environment is the way that it is. I, I don't think that it is um, an environment where metals should be languishing the way that they are, uh, and or that that premiums should be uh, as low as they are in comparison to where they have been over the last few years. Quite frankly, I think the world we live in now is is much more concerning and frightening than it was three years ago when all of this. Uh, higher premium and interest in silver really took off. So, look, uh, with all the sincerity that I can offer, I think this is the best time we've seen in, in over three years to um, to add a little bit of um, distance between you and the system and no better way to do it than in an asset like silver that not only is so massively undervalued but w continues to grow in its uses every single day and uh, being a great tool of, of, of you know, for, for monetary asset being just, just one of them. So, no, there's, I think we've certainly said, uh, said that uh, in enough different ways, but uh, I do believe it. And I think we, you and I will talk again before the end of the year and, and look back at this availability and these premiums as being something in the rearview mirror as uh, I can't help but feel that things are, are, are very fragile and at any given moment could could dramatically change. And uh, that's what I expect uh, as as we get closer and closer to the uh, 2024 election and all of the craziness that should accompany it. An event shaping up uh, to follow next year and wonder at times if that will put some pressure on the Fed and find out in a couple of weeks we will get the latest one, um, what's the pause, although Jerome Powell is perhaps two more interest rate hikes later this year. And other kids appreciate you made some time join me and check in on the latest conditions in the physical silver market. I know a lot of people appreciate hearing about that each week. And thanks again for being here. And we'll look forward to catching up with you next Tuesday. It's great to be here. And you're right. Things are going to get crazy over the next few Fed meetings and over the next few months. So uh, look forward to doing this with you every Tuesday. I look forward to chatting with you then as well. All right. Thanks, Andy. We'll see you next week. Take care. Bye-bye. Well, thank you, Andy, for this week's report. Always good to get his insight into the physical gold and silver market and see what's going on out there. Real quick before we wrap up, I would like to thank First Majestic Silver, who brought us today's episode. And they had consolidated cash costs of fifteen sixteen per silver equivalent ounce, all in sustaining cost of twenty ninety. Although, again, earlier this year, they did do the shutdown of Jarrett Canyon as costs were high there. And when you remove Jared Canyon, you see that those consolidated cash costs and all in sustaining go down to 1185 and 1538 per ounce. So something that will be interesting to see when First Majestic has their second quarter earnings and 
seemingly in position to benefit from that, the lower cost structure as obviously the Jarrett Canyon mining operation was bringing those levels a bit higher, but part of the reason why they closed down Jarrett Canyon and we will look forward to seeing the impact in their second quarter earnings, which won't be all too far off. So either case, thanks again to First Majestic for bringing us today's show. Hope you're having a great day out there and I will see you again tomorrow.